This is Bishop Gregory Brewer of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida giving a sermon at Church of the Redeemer, November 3rd, 2013 in Avon Park, Florida. If you had told me just a few years ago that I would wind up being the Bishop of Central Florida, I would have thought you were just crazy. It was never my intention. I, uh, in fact, the last place where my wife and I were serving, which was in downtown New York City, I thought that's where we were going to be for at least 10 years because the church needed a lot of help. And I thought that's where we would be. I got my start down here, came down here as a very green 24 year old who just straight out of seminary, didn't know a darn thing. I looked like a child in a clerical collar. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is it. We're, I'm coming to Central Florida. This is where I'm going to be. And yet the Lord has taken us on this very sort of circuitous route from Orlando to Pittsburgh to Philadelphia to New York City and then back down here again. All of which have come as something of a surprise. If you'd said, how are you going to map out your life? It would not have included those places. And yet that was clearly each step God had his hand in. He wanted us to go to those places. And when the call came to be asked to allow my name to go forward, at first, Larley and I both were like, well, no, we're supposed to be here. We'd only been there a little more than two years. And yet, people were insistent. We thought, well, I guess we better pray. And so we started to pray. I started asking different people, especially bishops, what do you think? Every single one of them said, well, of course you need to allow your name to go in. You don't say no to something like that. And as the cliche goes, the rest is history. I, I recount that story because you get the same impression with what's happening with Jesus in the Gospel reading. He's with his disciples. They're going to Jerusalem. That's the whole thrust, the whole focus. Jesus only intends, it seems, to pass through. He entered Jerusalem and was passing through it. In other words, I'm only getting through here. I'm not spending the night. And yet what happens is, as is often the case in the ministry of Jesus, a human need appears and God says, stop for this one. And that's what happens. Jesus is passing through Jerusalem. There is an enormous crowd, and understandably so, because before he even gets into, the, into Jericho, they're these blind beggars. They see miracles are happening here. And so the crowd is enormous as he gets into the city, the walled city, old city of Jerusalem, of Jer Jericho, sorry. And so here's Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus. Zacchaeus is probably about this tall. He can't see for the crowd, but he must have been pretty athletic because he climbed a sycamore tree to try to see who this man Jesus was. No doubt he had heard the miracle stories. No doubt something important was going on. Nobody attracts crowds the way Jesus did. And so Jesus sees him up in the tree. Not exactly the place where you would expect to see a man of wealth and distinction. And so that caught Jesus' eye. It's not dissimilar to the story that Jesus tells when he tells the story of the prodigal son. Remember at the end, when the prodigal is coming back home to his father's estate, it says that his father literally picks up his robes and runs to meet him. That would have been a shock to his audience for Jesus to tell that, because wealthy old men did not run. That was considered improper, even if you could physically do it. Your servants ran for you. You did not run. Well, the same thing here. A person of distinction, a man who is rich because of who he is as a tax collector, doesn't climb trees to see who this latest celebrity is here in town. Jesus notices that, and he comes up to him. Apparently, this is a part of God's divine plan. <coughs> Because he walks right up to Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to stay in your house tonight. In fact, it's actually even more open-ended. It says, 
I must stay with you in the implication of the word is, I'm going to come and be your house guest for a while. He doesn't say just for the evening. Everybody is shocked that Jesus would do that. Because you see, tax collectors were considered extortionists. Handpicked by the Romans to collect taxes for the Romans. They weren't given a salary because they could set whatever price they wanted in terms of what they felt like somebody could give. And then they gave what was required of them. And then they kept the balance. They were extortionists. So nobody expected this betrayer of Israel who collaborated with the pagan Roman government, who was an extortionist to boot, to be the person in all of Jericho where Rabbi Jesus, who performs miracles, would come and stay under his house. To eat and spend the night with someone is to present yourself as a collaborator, as someone who in fact approves of what's going on in that household. So they are horrified. But Jesus sees something in Zacchaeus that they don't see. What Jesus sees in Zacchaeus is a heart that is longing to know the one whom Jesus represents, the very God of Israel. And that's what we see in Zacchaeus' reaction. We don't know what transpired in that moment between G Jesus and Zacchaeus. But he climbed the tree, a notorious extortioner, and came down from the tree, a humble and generous man, who clearly would never extort people again. See what happens? When Zacchaeus hurries down, it says, he was happy to welcome him. That's actually not quite accurate. <laughs> happy actually is like saying, you haven't seen somebody for 20 years, but you're happy to see them? No. If there's someone you love dearly, you are overjoyed. And that's really what the Greek means. When he hurries down, he's excited beyond measure. He is rejoicing. He is, in fact, the word in the Greek is the same word for how the shepherds respond to the message of the angels at the nativity story of Jesus. <laughs> they can't wait to get there. He is thrilled. The people grumble. He's gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner, remember, the notorious extortioner. But Zacchaeus knows the grumbling. He knows his reputation in town better than anyone. And notice what Zacchaeus says. Look. In other words, pay attention. I'm about to change your mind about who you think I am. Something has happened inside of me I cannot explain. Half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. When did you hear a conversion story where that was the result? In other words, this is a shocker for his listeners. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, which of course he had, I will pay back four times as much. You see, there is, in fact, a principle. It's laid out in the book of Exodus. That if somebody is a cattle rustler and steals one of the herd, they're caught it is the responsibility of the thief at that point, not just to pay back the cow that he took, but to literally give him four cows for the man's trouble. Fourfold. And that's exactly the principle that Zacchaeus is echoing when he says here, I, if, any, if I've taken anything from anyone, I will pay back four times as much. No wonder Jesus says, Salvation has come to this house today. Something is definitely different in the life of this man. Because he is now, too, a son of Abraham. In other words, a true man of faith. Not the way you've seen him at all. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Zacchaeus literally in that moment becomes a living example 
of the kind of work that Jesus does in the lives of the people who are his followers. And more often than not, that kind of generosity and that kind of joy that we see in the life of Zacchaeus are meant, held up in the Gospel of Luke, to be the marks of those who are, in fact, Jesus' followers. Why is that so? Because look at what's happened in Zacchaeus. He was an outcast. He may have been rich, but the way he got his money was entirely dishonest. He was isolated. All kinds of... Jesus broke in and changed everything. Everything about the life of that man. No wonder he is overjoyed. There's something more here going on than the kindness of Jesus wanting to be the guest of Zacchaeus' home. A heart change has happened in Zacchaeus. And the fruit of that heart change is both the joy and the generosity. When I first came to know Jesus Christ, I was a freshman in college. At that point, I really didn't believe much of anything. <laughs> in fact, when I went away to school, I know God was laughing at this. I said inside, thank God I don't ever have to go to church anymore. Because <laughs> I didn't want to. I had a terrible opinion of churchgoers and a worse opinion of clergy. But when Christ broke into my life, I was ready. I was so grateful. I knew peace that I'd never known before, mercy and forgiveness. I knew the kindness of God in my life. I knew the companionship of his presence. I was no longer alone. Everything about who I was changed on the inside. And I was ready to do anything that God asked me to do. Now, I want you to know, I didn't think at that point it included ordination. That was, that's another story. But I really was ready. So when someone said to me, when I said, okay, what do I need to be doing? Well, taking time to be with God, reading the Bible, uh, making the time to pray, sharing your faith with other people, and tithing, giving away 10% of your income. If that's what he asks, of course I'll do that. I mean, it didn't even cross my mind to contend with that. So grateful was I for what God had done in my life. You know, I think if they'd said 25%, I would have done that. It didn't matter. I knew that God was going to take care of me. He had already changed the deepest parts of who I was so that if God could literally change me on the inside, then physical circumstances, food, clothing, and shelter, nothing, God can do that in a heartbeat. I wasn't worried in the slightest. And that's what we see, you see, in Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus' life was so deeply changed, he was willing to do anything that was asked of him. And as a good Jew, he knew that because he had been one who had extorted property, the strictest law, the requirement, he didn't want to cut corners in any way, was fourfold return. Giving away what he had to the poor. And that's what he did. And Jesus didn't turn around and say, oh, now that's too much, Zacchaeus. Don't get carried away here. Instead, Jesus commended the man and said, salvation has come to this household. A man has been set free. And the capstone of the story is Zacchaeus becomes a living example of the very ministry of Jesus. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. And the evidence clearly of being found is this kind of joy and this kind of generosity. The good news is Jesus does not say the Son of Man used to come to seek and save that which was lost. No, actually, the tense of the verb is this is why I am here. In other words, the Son of Man is still seeking and saving that which is lost. It is still possible for you and I, right now, 2,000 years later, to know the very same joy, the very same sense of being found, the same sense of God's companionship, of knowing that we are no longer alone, the wonder of His forgiveness and, the, and mercy, and an ability to be able to live knowing that He is with you. God is with you.
and that he will never leave you or forsake you. I want you to know, I'd give anything for that. Anything. Do you know that in your life? Do you know that kind of joy? Do you know that sense of God's companionship? Do you know that He will never leave you or forsake you? And that He has come and found you personally, individually. That He knows your name. That's the message of this story. That God cares enough, not just for Zacchaeus, but for each one of us. And that we can know that same sense of the wonder of his companionship, the depths of his faithfulness. You know what it takes? It's real simple. Number one, know that he's seeking you. He's not just seeking good people. Zacchaeus is an example that he wasn't just seeking after good people. So that no matter where you are or what you have done, he is seeking you. There is nothing that disqualifies you from the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And then in saying yes to his seeking you, the willingness to open all of who you are to him, regardless of what that is, your heart, your mind, your finances, your social arrangements, your business, your relationships, everything. Nothing gets off limits. He is, in fact, Lord. And to say, Lord, all of who I am is yours. I'll give away anything if it means your companionship. And he, in fact, will pour out that companionship on you. And use you as a channel of his love, his mercy, and his generosity to others. A life that is filled with incredible adventure as God begins to use you to touch the lives of other people. You have a whole new purpose. It's a purpose to serve and to bless and to give. Knowing God pouring through you all of those wonderful rich blessings. That's the message of Zacchaeus. So today's sermon really is an invitation. An invitation to say yes to that companionship, to that generosity, to that willingness to be used by God, that sense of His forgiveness and His mercy. Because the Son of Man is still seeking. He's still saving. Which means He's seeking you. He's seeking me. And He is the one who promises to never let us go. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you as we have prayed, you are here. And you are still seeking here. And you are still saving here. So, O oh Lord, I pray for anyone in this room who feels your tug. I pray that you would give them the grace and the mercy to yield. To say yes to you. And to hear the overjoyed invitation to come and be one of yours. Not just to sit in a chair, but to literally be one of your followers who says yes to you and becomes a channel of blessing for others. <clears throat> Lord, even as you redeemed the life of Zacchaeus, may you redeem the lives of this dear group of people here, Church of the Redeemer, that by their life they might express to this community your wondrous, joy-filled, redeeming work. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.